I mean, one of the things that um, Kim mentioned when I talked to him was that your interest in it is what kind of led you to develop this demo for this, the Sony GSQ PlayStation supercomputer, which, as far as I am aware, was shown at Seagraph in 2000, when um, you were asked to create something Matrix themed. Can you tell us anything more about what you created? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, then it just it would be good to put a little context um, behind it. And I, I, I would guess if you talk to Kim about it, you might know this context, but I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate it for this podcast. Um, so when we were making uh, the Matrix trilogy, it was obviously uh, had resonance uh, well beyond just visual effects technique. It was, it was much more um, uh, impactful with regard to the, some of the concepts underlying and in particular there were um aside from folks who were obviously uh triggered in a way to think existentially about what is real uh there were other people who were even at, at that time imagining uh, uh, a long road towards uh creating uh, the capacity to run massive simulations, you know, massive flawlessly real simulations that people could uh, live within, play within, tell stories within. And so those sorts of folks, there were many interesting folks that found us that had nothing to do with the film business. Uh, many people in different technologies and and artists and writers, um, scientists, engineers. There was a person who was very significant though in the game industry uh, that found us, the inventor of the PlayStation, uh, Ken Kudaragi. And we wound up, the Wachowskis uh, and Kim and I, uh, wound up having uh, a number of good long conversations over very nice meals. Uh, to talk about the future and, you know, as you can imagine, he had a lot of thoughts about that and in fact, you know, went on to describe in great detail, in a very prescient way, the, the, the coming of the cloud, basically, the ability to serve, uh, uh, you know, um, unlimited, uh, high bandwidth, exquisite content <laughs> not from your machine but from somewhere else and so anyway uh, this led to you know a good relationship and he uh, let us in on this experiment where he was gonna try to create this giant uh, playstation based parallel processing computer you know he was gonna band i think he was gonna band together 16 playstations to you know provide the the compute to run a new kind of uh, real-time simulation. And that's kind of the beginning. He's like, we, I would uh, like you guys to get involved in, and think about something you might want to do uh, with that capability. And it is interesting, you know, to bring up that test relative to today because Awakens, I think I get why, why you're asked that because Awakens, <laughs> in a sense, is a, is a dot connect back to this this uh, demonstration we did in 2000. And that demonstration was not a lot different. It was essentially um, a, a, um, a sort of a premise of creating uh, dramatic content that could be used, you know, at, in and of itself, you know, as a experience, but also could be used to help understand uh, how to stage story and cinematic scenes using game engines. It was both really. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, uh, the future idea at the time was that, well, in the future, uh, this will be uh, something that everybody does and people will be in world doing things like this, uh, being involved with other characters and with each other. Those were the underlying themes and we made it um, you know, a sort of a fantasy matrix scene, you know, a Trinity being chased on the rooftops of a, of a major city. 
Uh, and and oddly, you know, here we are. We we're almost 20 years later, and never expected uh, Matrix to return because of the what we thought was conclusiveness of the trilogy. <laughs> yeah. And then we realized it was. We realized that our colleagues, you know, the Wachowskis, wanted to tell another story, and so we, uh, Kim and I tried to understand well what would be our place in this new <laughs> in this new thing because it's so many years later and we're doing many different things and not often cinema directly like work going out and doing shoots so this is this is what we arrived at as the right the right way to participate in resurrecting the matrix so it really is your due smack in there <laughs> in a way and um, it, it's it, it, it's not as if we left, you know, we did that the Matrix and then we sort of all left for, you know, that many years. We we've always been in touch and we've actually been doing uh, lots of different experiments and innovations along the way. And in Kim's case, he brought what I consider probably, you know, perhaps the most unique, you know, capability to graphics that anyone has. Uh, he brought that capability to, um, and his experiences into, into Epic itself and has had a role, you know, working with Tim uh, Sweeney to transform Unreal into, <laughs> into the, uh, the very, you know, the very type of platform one would need to, to really uh, manifest these things. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, why an experience and not a game at this point with, with the Matrix Awakens experience? I mean, 20 years later. Well, it's, it is a bit of all. It's a bit of everything uh, on purpose. It's a hybrid, the, which is what, um, you know, immersive worlds, metaverse-like worlds are really going to be. They're going to have the capacity to, you know, to to game in. Of course, you could stage full games in these worlds, and a lot of uh, the experiences will be that because that's what uh, you know, uh, generation young generations really want. They want interactive engagement and play. Uh, but the exact same destination. Uh, could be used to create, you know, spectacle and story and experiences of every kind. Uh, creator, you know, whole creator communities can, and all of that stuff, things we've learned from Second Life will be directly applicable, are already directly applicable. So there isn't, um, unless unless the, uh, the, the folks who sort of, uh, you know, how would I put it, launch, specific destinations unless they really want to have a very specific game focus of a particular game uh you know there will be a lot of these environments that are going to be made by the users themselves mm, absolutely and the thing that um struck me about um the experience is the fact that you've made it open so that anybody can actually you know to um, use the assets and create stories with it it's, it's you know can you tell us a bit more about what your your thought process is there Oh, for sure. It's obviously, okay, so two things I would say about that. Firstly, you know, I've had several experiences and this was, this was like a new version of an old experience. And the, and that would be, you know, building something really big and complicated, like a studio at the same time that you're making some kind of entertainment product. I've been through like three versions of that where whole studios have been built, or four versions, whole studios built, right? Um, while also making a movie, which is a big deal. Like you're making companies and organization structures. And so it's really complicated product plus build. Um, in this case, it's not exactly that, but it's similar in so far as, you know, and Unreal 5 is really heading into its beta, mode right now, right? Like it's being uh, used by the first developer ecosystem. 
And along the way of making Matrix Awakens, they were essentially dog fooding, basically trying to figure out how to uh, work with um, you know, new features and capabilities that were not possible before, mm -hmm. uh, particularly Lumen and, and Nanite. Uh, and, uh, and in the case of the way that the city was made, this really extraordinary um, generative uh, uh, world building uh, tools uh, that are new, uh, the way that uh, a lot of the simulation content was put together, the, all the traffic and walking people, the deployment of metahumans. I mean, this is this was huge lift, mm -hmm. right? It was like bringing together these these different component pieces that have been in the making for years. And it's you know UE UE five is like a departure point. It's, it's always been considered to be a departure point. At least Tim Sweeney has always described it as you know the metaverse engine. Uh, so. This is going on at the same time that we're making the experience. So the experience is to showcase UE5, but it's also to showcase, you know, what you could do with a cinematic metaverse-like destination. So in the experience, you see, yes, you could, um, you know, put a performance, storytelling performance by actual known people, actors and such, you know, like cinema, but volumetric. So there's volumetric cinema at the beginning. Uh, then uh, it transitions to actual gameplay, you know, seamlessly transitions into, we're now in the story, we're actually having an interactive experience. It's fairly simple on purpose because, you know, it's it was such a big deal just to try to get something so complex to come together in like a year and a half. So, you know, it's a simple sort of chase scene, shooter scene, but uh, there, uh, you know, you know, all of these things are sort of taking place inside this, inside this simulation world. The last bit is actually probably the most interesting, insofar as, you know, the end of the, the end of the demo is really the beginning of the sandbox of Matrix Awakens because once you've gotten this little tease about you know types of things you can do there basically the city is you know yours you you can you can now wander and drive and mingle around and people it can be obviously so much more uh, there much more can go into this uh, you know whereby you know uh sandbox experiences can start being put on top of this you know infinitely right and um Absolutely, yeah. it's a pretty wonderful gift uh, to, to give to give developers and independence because this is very difficult to build e for even a, a talented company it'd be really difficult to make this kind of to get this starting point so um, it'll be interesting to see what happens I think it's a gift for machinima creators because to me what you've got there is a is a thematic open world sim and thousands and thousands of playable assets um, which you know it's it's you know, I, I saw a, I saw this great um, little machinima which tried to compare it to um, Grand Theft Auto, um, which I think we reviewed that for our um, uh, February films thing. But what struck me about um, uh, the, the experience is the, the level of detail down to what you can see in the windows of the buildings to the vehicles and all a lot of it. It's just absolutely stunning detail. So it's a real it's a real gift. Yes, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's a crossover moment, right? Because machinima, we've been using this term, it's in a sense is like overtaking a machine that was made for one purpose and turning it towards storytelling. And, but, you know, we do this at the same time, you know, fully, you know, knowing that, you know, the real world where we can take cameras and shoot things and tell stories like that, that, that seemed like some like really like high plateau in terms of visual, let's say visual fidelity, compared to where we began in Machinima, mm -hmm. and we're like kind of like there. We're like we're like there, right? We're like really one little beat, and then you know Machinima is cinema, right? It's we're we're about to have this crossover moment, yeah. And this is going to be amazing because it's going to unleash, 
you know, all all manner of new new types of storytelling. Um, before we move on, then, just tell us a little bit more about the Bullet Time Shop, um, how that was created, and why just why has that become such a seminal moment in our filmmaking history? And I and it, and it's truly inspirational for machinima creators, I think. But just tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, it, I think everybody um, on this uh, listening probably would agree with the general statement that you put everything, you put all of yourself into everything you do. You don't do anything thinking it's going to be, you know, um, you know, um, award worthy for example or or noteworthy you just do what you do right and when we made that shot there were multiple shots and they fit inside of a particular uh you know sort of philosophy we had during the matrix trilogy which was we wanted to do more than you know create a visual trick we wanted to we wanted to attempt to, you know, create some methods that might be um, the types of methods one might deploy if one was making virtual reality, actually. <laughs> so when we made the bullet time shot and then the, uh, that was like a word jumble. And then uh, <laughs> when we made the, made the, uh, made the, uh, the bullet time shots in the matrix and then we did uh, more bullet time scenes in the next two films we really started thinking about how one would capture reality such that you could essentially you know uh, have uh, something that would be termed these days computational photography photography that was transformable into three-dimensional and the reason why you would need that is because only only in a in a, a simulation would you be able to cheat time and space you would be able to you know manipulate time you could be in as many places at once concurrently if you wanted to you could have multiple views of things you could do all these sorts of things that defy physics that you know you you know you could never do in the real world so i think that it wasn't just you know, the method, it wasn't just the visual. I mean, it read in the concept came across in the visuals of it, right? It was, it, it, you knew that you could not move that fast. Even though it was slow motion, you could never get around objects like that unless you were in some form of virtual reality or simulation. And the reason why it resonated is because the whole narrative and the underpinning you know, concepts of the matrix itself were preceding the moment, <laughs> right? You were all being led, right, to this mind over matter, you know, mind over matrix moment. And uh, and and people hadn't thought about that as, I mean, some people have, like Philip K. Dick thought about that all the time, but the average person didn't really think about that. And so it hit the mainstream in the right way at the right time. Know, the dawn of the real mainstream internet age you know um, the rise of gaming and you know things like this were going on and so the audience was kind of softened up enough by that to be able to comprehend it and so it and it lasted uh, but it really was sort of you know, obviously carried on the the underlying premise of the matrix itself so to go so now to go to the next step you know um so we put it in even though we didn't have enough time to do all of what we were thinking but um you know so we had this is kind of like actually a part of the awakens story that i think is most uh is really it's quite interesting insofar as we essentially went back in the time capsule and pulled out data from 20 years ago and we literally used it these captures that we had you know photographic H hd video um scans all these things right and we pulled them out 
uh, they were literally stored in a salt mine, you know, in Utah somewhere underground. They were like in an underground storage area. And like, you could just imagine the Warner Brothers assistant, like at, with a, like a, you know, a miner's headlight, <laughs> like searching through boxes and Kim Library with his like photographic memory <laughs> saying it's it's probably going to be in this box and the file names are this that he like literally remain, remembers all the file names he's like you got to get this and so they like rescue this ancient data right and they have to like essentially convert it you know and they they bring back they resurrect this this material and they they use it to remake a, like a modernized version of virtual neo so so what what i what i find really interesting is back then we were like hey you know one day people are going to do this all the time and they're going to you know create uh, virtual versions of themselves and it's going to give them this strange form of immortality you know on the in the we didn't call it the metaverse at the time but like online virtual you know immortality and this will be a really big thing we talked about it all the time when we were making the matrix and then here we are 20 years later and we essentially resurrect this old data we build a modernized version of neo which is really fantastically made and now here exists this new neo <laughs> right that there's a neo now that could be you know deployed in a simulation or driven by keanu right in a world so keanu has you know he's one of the people who has you know a nice you know a nice uh, meta clone of himself um so anyway we use this to reproduce the shot but really at this time around rather even though even in awakens again it was it was part of a a 2d shot version of before you got into the playable but it, it that uh, material exists it's possible for us to actually go in and walk around this bullet time shot we could do it in vr um and and more right so we're getting closer to actualizing um that stuff and it was built upon this ancient stuff, and now it's going to keep going. Um, one one thing, just to keep it back to storytelling. Uh, I mean, one thing that I really would like to do, and I don't know if it's going to get done because it's it's up to Warner Brothers, which is really a difficult, you know, uh, path because it's a lot of people have to make decisions based on economics rather than passion. But like the the passion request that I had was maybe we need to continue the matrix in world you know not just on film and 2d mm -hmm. and it could i could easily imagine immersive stories that can still be the actors driving themselves um but immersive stories that you know can have uh branches into free exploration of the world and participation and, and all of these things so here's an example of where really the the vast potential of, of you know machinima or virtual cinema intersecting virtual worlds and and open worlds right it's a perfect combination you can f consider the consider the story path like a beautiful sculpture you know that's sitting inside of a dynamic open world, it's going to take a while for the behavior uh, of, you know, how people engage with virtual worlds to really, you know, mature, you know, you know, right now it's all sort of new and people aren't sure and people, it's not what they're used to doing. So it's, it's not to be expected that you're, you're going to have worlds that are filled with actual humans driving their avatars. This could be the early adopters <laughs> will yeah. go, you know, they'll be enthusiasts and early adopters, but a world really needs to be like filled with characters and, and events and things. So there's no doubt that training NPCs to understand world logic believe they're in the world um 
you know, not just be、uh, tourist like narration, like tourist machines. They they need to be able to you know sustain、uh, a place. In the world's,、uh, you know, makeup,、um, a, a role, and、uh, and so I could easily imagine large populations of AI-guided NPCs、uh, that that help you、uh, get a lot of depth and exposition if you're wandering off path.、Uh, that's definitely coming. It's not. I haven't seen it a lot yet. I've seen it. I've only. You know, there's a lot. Of, there's experiments. It's. It's getting to a point where it's getting、uh, fairly clean. Like you can. You know, you can, for example, happen upon、uh, some article on the internet written completely by a bot, and you might not know it. You know, it's getting. It's getting fairly sophisticated. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your thoughts on the role of NFTs and WebEx experiences generally, and and how might that influence or help machinima and real-time creators? Well, I think everyone's trying to understand it at the same time. the the need the need for a a premise whereby a digital、um, You know, object or item, or、uh, any kind of digital media, you know, had some ability of、uh, being unique and singular. Has always had been the barrier、uh, for digital art being taken seriously, and digital artists, not just digital artists, but like all kinds of artists, right,、uh, being able to,、uh, you know, have a piece of media. That can、uh, have value、um, and、uh, accrue and retain value like physical things can. The question is, you know,、uh, because be- before that time, a piece of digital art or media could be copied infinite. Is they can't, you know, these things can be copied infinitely, but there, and so people never thought there would be. A way to create value in one of those copies, but this this system、um, has opened the doors to that, and it's been talked about for quite some time. the the、uh, The need for this, unfortunately, you know, it's a wash with、uh, you know early、um, provocateurs, you know, trying to make a lot of money selling a dream of. Uh, value that may or may not really exist. The dream that I think is being sold is that if you buy this digital item, then this will accrue、uh, as we move towards. Really, the underlying the underlying message is as we move towards a a, a digital life, a, a life in the metaverse. These you know ownership of these. Things just like ownership of things in the real world will, you know, you know, will be uh, uh, valuable and and、uh, for you in the future. So, the thing is, though, is that those who the means that people draw attention to which digital things have value and which don't is really questionable. It's a very、uh, hype based and a lot of manipulation. Of perceptions of what matters and what doesn't. It's like this is important because you know it's the beginning of the metaverse, and you can have a piece of that. So I'm.、Uh, there's a lot of people who really are in the business of trying to create very, very valuable <laughs> experiences and and virtual content that look at this, you know, with some degrees degree of shock and disgust because. It really is, a, you know, it's a, it's a manipulation of people, you know. So, you know, in order to in order to inflate the value of currency, actually, not the the, the objects themselves. So,、um, so, but does that mean it's bad? It's us. It's not actually. It, it, it's like that. Eventually, will like anything. A lot of that hype is going to burn away,、um, and people will start. Uh, being able to determine what might have value and might, what might not. So the, to me, it's the that is the essential 
question for everybody is like, what has intrinsic value? And it could be, you know, different for each person. You know, what it may be like, you know, if you created something yourself, uh, then immediately you have an attachment to it, an emotional attachment to it. And like, and that wouldn't be any different than an artist in the real world doing that. Some people might find your creation genuinely compelling. Your, your creation could be, there's, you know, infinite form factors. Uh, so we need to have a much more serious conversation about what has intrinsic value. Now, I think that go now sort of circling back to your, 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 uh, your question. I think that, uh, there could be, um, a lot of, um, incredible, uh, experiences to be had on remarkable works in machinima. And, uh, and I think that, um, the, um, the question is, you know, um, will others, you know, that are in a peer group that we care about, um, if they, if they agree that there is, um, value there, uh, then, then there's a future for machinima and NFT, just like any other art form in NFT. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's really m more about, you know, what what's going on under the hood. Uh, it can be like spiritual, it could be technological, it could be like a, a philosophy of design. It could be, you know, you know, it's it's like anything else. It's innovation. So why is a Picasso worth what it's worth? You know, you know, what was Picasso doing at the time? that was different than everybody else. He starts a movement in a direction, right? And, you know, paintings are interesting uh, just as a, to, to relate to because, you know, they, they uh, you know, some are literal and some are more metaphor, some are conceptual and the concept, if you understand the concept, that's, that's where you might believe the value lies is, oh, that's a, a remarkable concept and it floats to the top, you know, um, in terms of, you know, being viewed as valuable. So that's the way I think things have to be viewed. Mm. I was wondering if you, if, you know, from your view of it, whether you thought there needed to be some sort of intervention, which might make it a more democratic environment for creators rather than let the market sort it out. Because markets just fail. All yeah, the time, I think these they? particular, these markets at the moment are highly manipulated. Mm. Um, they really are. And I think that they will get sorted out at some point. They'll either be sorted out through regulation or they'll be sorted out by, um, the, by the consumers of, of these things who, will, who can vote <laughs> with their pocketbooks, with their wallets, right? Um, but what, what the, the real, uh, the real, um, sort of distortion on 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 things is tends to be how social media and influencers you know sort of you yeah. know cause uh, confusion about what matters and what doesn't and that's really the main issue to to work out is who should you listen to it's 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 nice to have you know some item registered on a blockchain so we know it exists but it's a little bit different to know if you know these 10 you know groups or people that i believe in and trust their points of view because they have a whole lifetime of uh sort of correct <laughs> points of view or like points of view yeah. i agree with Absolutely. if i if i look to these these 10 these these 10 you know people and um they know what they're talking about then i'm like okay i there's probably value there right because there's consensus in some way but i don't really want to be only looking at um irrational market behavior around a piece of art you know without the consensus of humans <laughs> right also in the mix you know humans that know something about art or appreciate it at the very least are you a red or a blue pill person oh you're asking that um <laughs> i'm sure you've been asked it before 
Yeah, I know, but like in our culture, everyone's trying to hijack the colors. Oh, and I, so you're I purple then? I, <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm full spectrum. I'll, I'll go with every shade of color. Depends on the mood.